Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 6. I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it says here, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons of by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glory of his grace, which he has made us accepted in the beloved. What an incredible thing to be accepted. We, as human beings, that is a deep craving of our hearts is to be accepted. And so because Jesus accepted us and he accepted us with imperfections and our sinful natures and all of that. He accepted us. He says in Romans chapter 15, verse 7, then accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. It is a great feeling to be accepted. We want to be fit, wanted by others. We all want to be belonging to a group where we are accepted. That is why there are so many different clubs and bars and societies and biker groups and on and on that people come together. They want to be accepted. And as wonderful as it is to be accepted, it is a frightening and terrible thing to be rejected. I can remember I grew up um, and, and when my dad was pastoring a downtown church and we were right across the street from a, a big uh, play area and tennis courts and all of that kind of a thing. And I remember so many times when they would pick up teams in the summer and, and they, you know, they would start, they would line everybody up and then they would start choosing somebody. It was a dreaded thing to be the last one picked, wasn't it? It was like, oh, you know what, <laughs> we got to take that guy. We know he's going to strike out every single time, but we, we just got to have him on the team. It, it was always a dreadful thing not to be immediately accepted. And so we, we've grown up that way. We want to be accepted. We want to be on that inside circle with somebody. It does not feel good to be excluded. Every group of people has an inner circle, and we all want to be part of that. We don't get voted into that inner circle. It comes by invitation by those who are on the inside. And those inside group, that inside group, has information known only to that circle. They, they say they have inside jokes and all of those kinds of things, a language that that inside group only knows. And so in Mark chapter 10 and in Matthew chapter 20, you don't need to turn there this morning, but Jesus' disciples had the very same problem that we have. They, too, wanted to be included. They wanted to be in on that inner circle. And so James and John the nerve of them, approached Jesus, and they asked Jesus, can we be in that inner circle when we get to heaven? And it doesn't get any tighter than this. They said, you know what? We want to be seated on your left side and on your right side in heaven. Man, you talk about pushing it to the limit. These guys, they wanted, they wanted to be right there in the middle of it all. And then they knew a really strong secret. How many of you when you wanted to get something, you would go to your mom, and then if she had to, she would go to talk to your dad for you. Anybody? I did. I, I, my, my dad oftentimes would be the more strict one, so we had to soften my dad a little bit by asking my mom first, and then she would go and, you know, honey, they really want this. Oh, okay, you know, like whatever, give it to them. Um, we knew by approaching mom that that was going to be the end to get in there. So the disciples are thinking that same thing. They go, you know, Jesus is not going to turn down mom. If mom asks, she's surely going to get us there on the left and the right seats there in heaven. So they got their mother involved asking for them in Matthew chapter 20. And when that happened, Jesus must have, he must have just shaken his head in disbelief like, really, guys? <laughs> you think that's going to work, getting your mom involved in this whole thing? Jesus was always talking about including everyone. He wanted everyone to come into his inner circle. He thought that heaven was so good 
that nobody should miss it. Everyone should want to go there. He says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but that everyone would come to repentance. He wants everybody to get saved. He wants everybody to spend eternity with him in heaven. He wants everyone included. It's us that make decisions and say, you know what, no, I, I really don't want to be that close to you, Lord. C.S. Lewis says that we, the, the hell is created for people that want to say, you know what, I want to make a choice, and I don't want to be around you, and I don't want to be around you forever and ever. And hell was designed for that, for us to make our own choice to say, you know what, I don't want any part of God. I want away from him forever and ever. Look at Matthew 15. Matthew 15, look down to verse 21. When you first look at this passage of Scripture, and I'll just warn you ahead of time if you are new to this, but it looks like Jesus is being very rude here. And so you have to, you have to know Jesus. You have to know his character, and you, and you understand that Jesus is not rude. And so when you, you read this chapter, you have to understand something else because that, that doesn't work. That's not in his character to be rude. So let's read this, verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. Now, as I said, this is not Jesus being rude because that's not in his character. So there is a lesson that he's trying to teach probably first of all to the disciples, something that they will never, ever forget. He's giving here a test for two sets of people. He's testing the disciples, and he's also testing the woman. And these tests teach us such a powerful lesson on the pain of being excluded and the power on the opposite end of that of being included. And so this story, it tells us, this takes place in the region of Tyre and Sidon. The Jews would have despised the people that lived there. They were their worst enemies. They would have had nothing to do with them. They didn't, they didn't associate with them. They wouldn't even go near them. They hated these people. This woman was a Canaanite woman, a Gentile, and so she would have been thought of by the Jews as a total outcast. Have nothing to do with them. Don't sit across the table from them. Don't eat with them. Don't do anything with these people. But this woman breaks down all of the, the norms of society at that point, and she comes on behalf of her daughter. When, when moms are in need of something, they get desperate, and, they're, and sh this woman is desperate. She is seeking for help, and she has heard that Jesus can touch people's lives, that he can change their lives. And so even though this is absolutely wrong in the social norms of that day, she comes and breaks through all of that. She wants help for her daughter no matter what happens. And as I said, Jesus acts downright rude to her, and he doesn't even bother answering her at first. The disciples, of course, they're done with this lady right from the very beginning. They're not giving her the least little chance, and so they're probably embarrassed. They're, they're probably wanting her out of the way. She's calling after them. They're like, you know what, this is embarrassing to us. We don't associate with this woman. 
And then they go to Jesus and they say, you know what, Jesus, just send her away. Get rid of her. Notice that they use the word there, us. <laughs> Them and Jesus. They include themselves in the inner circle with Jesus. We're better than you, woman, so get out of here. Leave. Please go away. There is always this human tendency in us that we love to feel that we're better than others by excluding others from our group. And then the second test comes to the disciples, and Jesus responds to their statement by saying, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. <laughs> they, the disciples would have very much remembered that um, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, it's recorded that Jesus said, many will enter the kingdom from the east and the west, and Jesus, of course, was talking there about the Gentiles. Many of you, Gentiles, us, were Gentiles. He was including us in that. And if the disciples would have remembered him saying that, you're, 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 you would look at that as, as disciples and say, Jesus, the wait a second. You weren't just sent to Israel. You said you were sent also to the Gentiles. Why tell this lady that? You know that she's a Gentile. Why exclude her? Jesus was hoping in some way that the disciples would, would speak up here and say, No, Jesus, you know that's not you. You are wanting everyone to come. You're wanting the Gentiles to come. You're wanting the Jews to come. Why would you make a statement like that? Jesus here is giving a test. He's hoping that one of the disciples will, will maybe sheepishly raise their hand and say, you know what, Jesus, that's so unlike you. That's, that's not you. You're, you're wanting everybody to come. You want to include everybody. Why would you say that to this woman? But they all agree here to send her away. Still, this woman does not give up. She is desperate for her daughter. She seeks help, and she begs Jesus, need to help me. I am not leaving here till I get what I've come for. And then Jesus calls her a dog. This isn't probably, like, fluffy at home. Um, the dog that you so are endeared to um, these dogs you know ran ran the streets they were wild dogs and they uh, very much were were not domesticated and they were very mean and so when he's when he's talking about that he's he's giving a very derogatory term to this woman he's saying you know what um, that you know those that's dogs that um, it, you know, it's like what we think about with coyotes that are infesting the land. We, we, you know, there, there's open season on coyotes. So it would be the idea, no, these dogs, you can shoot these dogs at any time. This is not your nice house pet at home. These are, these are rough dogs. He, the term that he uses is not the domesticated pet. And I, and I think that as, as Jesus says this, it is one thing to think thoughts badly about someone behind their back. It is another thing to hear the ugliness of our own words when we're saying it to another human being. I, I find it incredibly fascinating that on social media and Facebook forums and all of that, that it, it is so easy being disconnected from somebody to say the meanest things that you could ever think of. And so many people use that forum to attack others. It's another thing to stand face to face to someone and hear the ugliness of your own words. But here again, this is not what Jesus does. This, this is so against his character. He's doing this for a purpose. It's a test for the disciples. It's a test for this woman. Still, through all of that, Jesus they're, they're probably going, oh, right, Jesus. That's what we think of her, too. We want nothing to do with her. She's just one of those mean dogs that runs the streets. Good for you, Jesus. Go for it. Really go for the juggler here. Not one of them speaks up on behalf of the woman. Sad. 
Jesus was trying to teach the disciples that exclusion was sin, not a good thing. Years ago, I when I uh, went the pastor um, Christian life up at, up in the mountain, I um, I went I started going to the ministerium, and uh, another new pastor came into that area and into the ministerium, and his very first meeting he comes and there's. There's probably 10 pastors there or more, and he comes into the room, hardly says hello, and then he goes around and, and places a questionnaire at, in front of every single pastor around the table. And I looked at the questionnaire, and, uh, and I was like, man, what, what is this guy doing? All kinds of questions. Do you believe in this? Do you believe in that? And all. And um, so I... You know, a little bit of rebellion here maybe, but I just didn't fill it out. I'm going, that guy, I don't care what he wants to know. He's not getting it from me. So I didn't, I didn't even read the whole questionnaire, but apparently back in, in, in those days, Promise Keepers was, was very big with the men and big events that the Promise Keepers were having. And, and I, I mean, at least the way I felt about it, I thought they were a great organization. They were bringing men together for worship and for teaching and, a great thing, I thought. And so um, this pastor gives the questionnaire, and then he leaves, doesn't stay for the meeting or anything. A few days later, all of us get a letter from him and saying, um, because you guys support Promise Keepers, which apparently was in the questionnaire, because you support them, I am not going to fellowship with you guys as a ministerium. <laughs> I'm going, oh, whoopee ding. I was kind of, you know, like, wow. <clears throat> but I thought to myself, wow, you know, like, they're, they're obviously, you no, know, there was pastors, and you know if you've been to different churches, there's little things that different churches do differently. And, you know, we laid those aside as pastors, and we, we stayed on common ground around the Lord Jesus Christ. And some people believed, you know, in water baptism that you went forward once and back three times and, if there was any breath left in them, then you, you brought them up. And, you know, it was, that, it was that kind of a thing. But those things are minor. You know, we, we wanted to surround ourselves that we believe what the power of the gospel can do. Here, this pastor was coming in, and he's focusing on one little thing that he wants to say, this is the criteria for whether I am included with you guys. Jesus calls sin what in certain religious circles often passes for virtue. The religious leaders of Jesus' day believed that their refusal to associate with people who did not live up to their religious standards was the highest proof of their devotion to God. <laughs> so the more people that you excluded, the more spiritual they thought that you were. I'm not going to hang with that person because of this, and I'm not going to hang with that person. And they thought that that's a badge of spirituality. I'm going I'm to exclude as many people as possible, and, man, I'm going to be the closest to God. The more spiritual that you tried to be, the bigger the category of outcasts got. So people were excluded on their ethnicity, on their gender, on their physical problems, on practicing whether they felt these are despised jobs and so we're not going to we're not going to have anything to do with you tax collectors and dung collectors and pigeon keepers and all of those people that had those jobs you're not included with us if you had a job cleaning sewers like we're not hanging with you at all that's out that's out but Jesus reversed that and he comes and he sits and he eats across the table like we're going to do in just a little bit. He eats across the table from the people that the rest of the world, the rest of that society had excluded from any kind of fellowship whatsoever. He eats with them. The, the Jews thought, you know what, I will never ever sit down across the table from a Gentile. I, I will never sit down across the table from a prostitute or a tax collector. I will never do that. I'll never associate with any of those kinds of people. And Jesus comes and he sits down across the table from the worst of sinners. 
and he showed, he wanted to show, and especially to the religious leaders of that time, he wanted to show how sinful that whole system of outcasts was. That was not what Jesus was about. And so he did that over and over again and got criticized over and over again. You're hanging out with all the big partiers, Jesus. You can't be a godly man at all. And they accused him over and over of those kinds of things simply because he did not exclude himself from the company of people that they absolutely had excluded a long time ago. And so this woman continues to press on despite all of the obstacles. She needs an answer. And it's amazing, you know, when we are desperate, whenever we really need something from God, all of the, the proper protocols don't mean a hill of beans, do they? We, we, we get desperate. When we need something from God, you know what? I'm breaking down all the social norms because I've got to go to Jesus. And I don't care where that's at and then where, who you're with. You want help and you go and you break down all the social norms because you want desperately an answer to your need. And this woman comes breaking down... <laughs> what seems to be such rude behavior on the part of Jesus and the disciples. And she breaks down every wall and keeps coming back over and over again. And Jesus says to her in the end, your faith is great. You didn't let anything deter you. You didn't stop at all. You kept coming even though people tried to push you away. You kept coming. You know, when I think about that in so many different, we, we're often so conscious of what people think about us, aren't we? Sometimes we, we're afraid to raise our hands or we're afraid to say praise the Lord loudly or whatever. You know, someone might think I'm a little bit too fanatical or whatever the case might be. You, you know, when it comes to worshiping the Lord, he is everything, isn't he? And so we break, <laughs> we break down all of our inhibitions and everything. We say, God, I'm going to praise you because you're worthy of that. And if my friend sitting beside me doesn't quite understand that, um, they'll get used to it after a while. They'll, get, they'll understand, I love you, Jesus. I'm going to break down all the obstacles because I need you, and I desperately need you, Lord. Worship team, if you'd get ready to come. Jesus never excludes anyone except those that refuse to enter on their own. Darla was telling me um, a story about Wednesday night. I'm not going to use their names. Um, they were kids, but one kid has been coming for quite a long time. He goes to our academy here, and uh, the other boy um, is pretty new. I think he's only been here for a few weeks. Um, his, his parents don't come to church here. So this boy that has been here and is part of the academy he is very accommodating, if, if you know him, and he just, he's always, he's very welcoming, and he's, he's a great kid, and he, so in the games that they were playing, he takes this boy that nobody knows, and that's kind of shy, because he's in, in a brand new group, and he takes this boy, and like includes him in all that they're doing in the games, and then he says to this new boy, he says, man, you are doing incredible, the great Great job. Every, every time he did something, there was such encouragement that he was giving him. So later, they had to choose teams again, different teams. And this boy that's brand new, he says, can I be on that boy's team? And, and, he, said, and he said to Darla, my wife, Jason, he said, you know what? He's always encouraging me. And I thought to myself, wow, kids need that. Adults need that. We, we need to encourage one another. I, I was amazed, and I don't know, Mrs. Jacobs, if you made him do this or what, but in every practice for the Christmas program um, for the academy, when those that were doing solos in practice, this is just practice, nobody's here, but whenever someone did a solo, then the whole student body and all the rest of the, of the cast would applaud them, like, good job, you did a good job. 
Every single practice. And I looked at that and say, you know, after you've been with that, your friends for a while and they do their part and you do your part, it's like, it's old stuff. Every single practice, they applauded those kids that were brave enough to do a solo for that, for that group. And I thought, wow, what an encouraging thing that is. Well, we, sometimes we need to learn some things from kids, don't we? They, they, uh, they understand the power of encouragement. We, as adults, need to be encouraging. I, I know as a pastor that the full counsel of God in the Word of God has some very difficult things to say. And so some things, sometimes when I'm preaching, there are some difficult things that you have to say when you preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. That's, that's a given. It offends me sometimes when I read it. <laughs> that's a good thing. I'm convicted when I read it. That's a good thing. But I also know that I need to be as encouraging as possible because we live in a world where that doesn't happen. It, it probably doesn't happen at most of your workplaces. Maybe it doesn't happen even in your own family that you come from. And so we need to be encouraging to one another that our words don't bring death, but they bring life. That it encourages, that it that lifts people up, that it spurs people on, as it says in Hebrews 11, to love and good deeds. That we need, we gather together as a body, as a family, in order to encourage one another. You know what, brother? You know what, sister? You can make it. Don't let the devil lie to you. Don't let him turn you back. You can make it. I'm praying for you. And as we gather together, we give words of life. We include people by our speech and by our actions. We say, you're welcome here. I'm praying for you. I want to see you make it. I want to see you make it all the way to you meet the Lord face to face. And we encourage one another on simply by our actions, by our speech, by giving life to other people. Let's be encouragers, amen? Let's give life with what we say and what we do to other people. Let's include everybody because Jesus does. Stand with us.